The Midwest is the breadbasket of America. Its thriving communities are the perfect place to raise a family. But something else lurks here. Hidden from view, packs of predators prowl these streets. Fiercely territorial, they're out for blood. They got about six, eight foot in front of me and got extremely aggressive, ears pinned back, growling. I've seen him stand in the yard and paw at the ground like a bull would. They appear to have some blood on their muzzles and on their coats. They're dangerous by themselves, but in a pack, they're unstoppable. Eyewitnesses across the country report seeing large packs of wild dogs with mangy, disheveled coats and unpredictable behavior. Usually consisting of several dogs, these packs are often disease-ridden and aggressive. The packs are made up of abandoned domestic pets and dogs that have been living wild for generations. To survive, these creatures scavenge for food, hunting in teams. They kill animals and sometimes even attack humans. As I was getting ready to put the mail in the door slot, I heard a panting behind me. Patricia Redding, a Detroit postal worker, was delivering to her usual route when something unexpected happened. And as I turned to my right, I saw the dog on his uh, hind legs about to attack me. I turned and got my pepper spray and I sprayed the dog and I took my satchel, my mail satchel, and tried to protect myself. But the dog was immediately headed for my juggler vein in my neck. Redding managed to escape. She was bitten numerous times on both arms and legs and has nearly a dozen scars. They are a constant reminder of the danger that lurks around every corner here. It's very hard when you've been through what I've been through, and I, I don't think I could really deal with the dog on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The city of Detroit has been under siege from these packs. I stopped mail service for six and a half weeks uh, in one zone, a portion of the zone, because the dogs were attacking the carrier, the people, and uh, animal control was unsuccessful in capturing the dogs. The largest city in Michigan is not alone. This video from Toledo, Ohio, shows a vicious dog attack. To make matters worse, dogs are by nature pack animals. When left in the wild, they will likely join up with other wild dogs in order to survive. These packs are known as feral dogs. The term feral refers to an animal that was once domesticated, but has returned to the wild and survives on its own. But there are some who contradict the idea that dogs gone feral are a threat to man. I would hesitate to call ferals in these big cities yet because they really haven't demonstrated successful reproduction over and over. Peggy Callahan is the executive director of the Wildlife Science Center in Forest Lake, Minnesota. She is skeptical of the problem that feral dog packs pose and instead suggests that poor ownership creates dangerous dogs. Some of these packs of dogs are actually owned. I mean, we know there are cases where the dog digs out, the dog runs, um, th and that pack of dogs belongs to someone now, albeit, you know, a irresponsibly and, and attacks and kills. It is not a breed specific issue. It is a human behavior specific issue. We're missing the point. We're not getting at the root of the problem. We need to be making it not an economically beneficial thing to have these, these dogs um, bred for aggression or trained for aggression. However, the city of East St. Louis has a major feral dog problem. Part of this problem stems from dogs bred to fight and turned loose by their owners. These dogs may be adapting to the wild, and some experts say they are reverting to their wolf-like tendencies. I can tell you, it's like watching a dysfunctional family of wolves. Randy Grimm is the founder of Stray Rescue of St. Louis and an expert on feral dogs. I've been watching feral dogs for so long and studied one pack in particular for a while, for two years. See these legs? 
He's been tied down like a bait. These are bait dogs. These are dogs used to teach other dogs how to fight. While Grimm has studied feral packs for years, there's still much he doesn't understand. What do they do when I leave? Who do they pack up with? Is there more than just this pack? Is there another pack they may go to? How do they survive? Monster Quest will launch an expedition to study these wild packs. Grimm and a team of scientists will attempt to capture evidence of these dogs in action. They'll determine what they're hunting and see if they might be carrying deadly diseases. DNA testing will determine whether there are genetic ties to more aggressive breeds. I think this will be rather unique, actually, because I don't think anyone has seen kind of the secret lives of these feral dogs. The rig that we devised is what we call a store on board system, meaning the video that we collect will be stored actually on the collar. Joshua Millspaw helped design the Monster Quest collar camera. It is equipped with two tracking devices and a timed release mechanism that will allow the team to recover the video footage. We'll put this transmitter on the collar and when the collar drops off, it has a specific frequency. And so we can use a, a receiver to home in on where that collar is by, by homing in on this transmitter. Another thing we have is a GPS, a uh, global positioning system. And what this will do is it will give us a position or a fix of where that animal was throughout the time that we're collecting videos. Dr. Ed Bigneko, a veterinarian who has worked with feral dogs, will join the expedition team. When a feral dog comes in, we see almost any infectious transmittable disease possible. We see uh, internal parasites, external parasites, uh, infectious diseases. We've seen cancers that can be transmitted from one dog to another. They will begin their search in East St. Louis. In just five decades, this city's population has declined over 60%, leaving many abandoned buildings and deserted homes, all potential havens for feral dogs. Grimm leads the team to a location where he's been tracking a feral pack for months. The cool weather and recent rainfall likely means the pack looked for shelter. This trail, this is their trail. You can see their own bed that they made themselves. Nope. That's a tire. This is a feral dog's dog bed. I'm going to go inside here. If we flush them out, they'll probably just go across the street. There's an entrance. You can see where they've been laying. There's, there's another dog bed that they made. So I'm going to take a look. I don't, I don't see any dogs here at all. Just, I can tell they've been here, but I don't see anything. The presence of feces is a clear indication that the dogs have taken up residence here. I'll get a sample of this and we'll take it back to the clinic. Yeah. The sample will provide insights into what these dogs are eating. Pull it inside out and then seal it. They're looking for an animal so that Dr. Mcneco can draw blood for a DNA test. Hopefully we're going to learn something about the lineage of some of these dogs and their DNA analysis uh, and what, the, what different breeds we may be uh, seeing out here. The search of the building reveals that the pack is not here. They quickly spot a single feral on the street, a perfect candidate for carrying a camera. Okay, this is a very feral dog. If you look at her characteristics, the size, the face, you can't really distinguish any breed when you look at her. Knowing that hunger is a powerful motivator for these dogs, the team lures it in by tossing scraps of food. Donna's gonna keep her over here. We're gonna set the trap up over here. Just keep lobbing, Donna. Daryl's gonna set that up super fast. Donna, once I walk away from here, 
I want you to start lobbing towards the trap, okay? Taking the bait, the feral moves closer to the trap. Here we go. It looks like we're gonna trap him. Here we go. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Got her. Done. With the animal secured, the team quickly programs the collar. All right, now arm this thing. All right, that is good news. I'm communicating with it. Okay, I'm gonna set the. Uh, I'm gonna set this thing to start at eight o'clock. I'm gonna put it on real time clock. Dr. McNeco and his assistant move in to sedate the dog before it can be collared. The doctor is using a pole syringe to maintain a safe distance during the procedure. Why don't we see in the straight That's a great idea. Like, like, like the idea. Yeah, when are one. you ready? I'm ready whenever you guys are. Okay. Okay. Let me get my stuff out of the way. We're going to get her used to being in the back of the cage. Same all the way up straight oh, up, guys. Okay. That's good, guys. The sedative is administered. But even sedated, the animal may still be able to bite. They secure a muzzle on the dog so McNeco can examine the feral safely. She probably has no idea if she's okay. Yet. Yeah, she looks good. She's, you know, I like this. She's just sedated enough to work on, but we can... And she's scared, so... Yeah. She's, she's, not, she's bone thin. My lord. Yeah. Sometimes the hair is so deceiving. I mean, can you get a picture of this? I mean, she's still got milk. Yeah, we just got her uh, pups the other day. They shave the dog's neck so McNeco can draw blood for DNA testing. The team then positions the collar. All right, let's watch it. Get that muzzle out of the way, guys, first. All right. Let's just see how, how tight it is. I don't think she's going to get it all. Okay, well then now we need to. A little, it's a little loose. Yeah. I mean, do you have the ability to tighten it or is that it? We, we could go one more. I would go one I more. Would, I would personally. Yeah. You'd be pretty mm. amazed at what they get over your head. Yeah. You can do it without it being a big deal. With the color in place, okay. they stand back as the sedative wears off. He's waking up. Then, they realize there's a problem. The collar may not be secure. And she's waking up. It's too late now, guys. No, she's, it's too, too late. late. It's too late. It's too late. Where? MonsterQuest is searching America's heartland for evidence of feral dog packs terrorizing its streets. Experts say the aggressive tendencies of these dogs can be traced back thousands of years. What we know now, uh, genetics tells us that all domestic breeds that we're familiar with, uh, from Chihuahua to St. Bernard, actually have a common ancestor of the gray wolf. Scientists believe that the evolution of the dog from the wolf began roughly 15,000 years ago. It is thought that dogs first split off from wolves in East Asia and then migrated around the planet as humans populated the world. The animals likely reached what is now North America about 12,000 years ago. Wildlife biologist Peggy Callahan has been studying wolves and dogs for two decades. And when you're watching dogs, it is very helpful to watch wolves so that you can actually interpret some of the behaviors that you're seeing with dogs. It is widely known to experts that domestication greatly affected breeding. We selected characteristics that we liked in those wild animals and then selected against the ones we didn't like. Historically, some degree of aggression in dogs has been helpful to mankind. The very early utilitarian purpose for dogs was either guarding a food source or guarding us or both, and, or, or acquiring a food source. It was the native North American Indians who were the first to develop the use of dogs for work in packs as well as for sentry duty guarding settlements. 
The species was then used against the American Indians during the Seminole War of 1835 in Florida and Louisiana. It was here that aggressive Cuban-bred bloodhounds were used by the army to track the Indians and runaway slaves in the swamps. In modern days, the brutal practice of dogfighting has led to even more aggressive animals. Recently, the, the bully breeds, the pit bulls, the bulldogs, etc., have fallen into favor with folks that use them for aggression. Fighting dogs is, a hu is huge money making in the city. When you get economics involved, there's so many dogs that are selected for aggression. The Center for Disease Control says that two breeds, the pit bull and rottweiler, account for one third of all dog attack fatalities. It's not difficult to tap into a dog that was bred for fighting and get that dog aggressive, and then you put that dog in a circumstance where it gets an opportunity to attack. It will and can. When these aggressive dogs can no longer win fights, they are sometimes killed or often let loose and end up joining wild packs. There is residual tendencies to, to, to hang together socially. So the, the pack guards territory, guards resources. When aggressive dogs mix with the feral population, those traits are passed to future generations. The science team will do genetic testing to see if these aggressive breeds are mating with the feral population. There certainly can be a genetic basis to aggression. Geneticist Dr. Neil Fretwell will test blood from the feral dog the team captured in East St. Louis to try to identify the dominant breed. The technology involved in testing dog DNA has really been developed over about the last four years since the sequencing of the canine genome. DNA science has been around for nearly 20 years, but it wasn't until 2005 that a group of scientists established a map of canine DNA to determine a dog's traits. Certain breeds have characteristic temperaments, so there certainly are um, behaviors within certain breeds that you would expect to, to find. Um, a good example is perhaps the Border Collie. So all Border Collies are well known for their intelligence and herding behavior, because that's what they were selected to do by the people who needed a good um, shepherd dog um, in the British Isles as they were looking after their sheep. The benefits of testing an animal are that you can find out um, what is in their genetic background and how that will influence their appearance and behavior, for example. The dog that was trapped by the expedition team in East St. Louis was also fitted with a collar camera. Yes. And she's waking up. It's too late now, guys. No, she's, it's too, it's too late. late. It's too late. It's too late. The animal threw off the collar within seconds of its release. Broke? Did it break it? Oh, no. I'm going to take this thing off. And... What happened? Just, you know, it was made for a 13-inch neck. While the technicians are working on the collar, Grimm spots the pack. I'm going to start lobbing, okay? You just start setting up the trap. The team hurries to get the trap ready as the pack watches from a safe distance. They attempt to bait the animals with food. They're going to leave faster. The fresh bait attracts them, and they approach the trap area. Wait a minute, hold on. It's OK. Let's, let me see. I think this one, one of the younger ones is taking the bait. One dog takes the bait and, after a short time, enters the trap. Awesome, awesome, awesome. As you can tell, uh, you know, the size is, he's, he's full grown, probably close to a year old, probably the same as the other dog, 30 to 35 pounds. Um, curious if related at all to the, the pack that's further down the street here. They sedate the animal. Let's do it, Randy. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, let's try, I can try it this way, Randy. You want to? Yeah, I can distract. Okay, ready? Not fighting. Here you go, buddy. It's not going to like that. They got stuck on the bars. They decide they need to try something different. This guy 
could Perfect. easily run on us, so Still we're not going to lose him. There's no way we're going <laughs> to lose this guy. Are you tipping the cage up? Are you guys going to do it? No, no. we're going to just try to get him out. Okay. Yeah, I'm not bad at I'm okay. Okay, you want me to bring them all the way out, Ed? I'd like to. That way I can be safe and know I got it. Yeah, okay. Right the muscle. It's not going to be... The situation quickly gets dangerous as the angry dog attempts to bite them. Stop. Cover him. Cover him. Cover him. Look out, Ed. Look out, look out, look out, look out, look out. Cover him, please. Cheryl, please. Look out, I can take real quick. The team restrains the dog so it can be sedated. His reaction is, is completely what I would have expected. I mean, he's, this is the first time this dog has ever been touched by a human being. Ever. It's not, I'm going to go ahead, Daryl. He's on his way, so I'm going to go ahead. This is not the safest thing. The sedative takes effect quickly, giving the team time to get the collar ready. So, Joel, you got it set to go at 9. It'll go 9 to 11. 9 to 11. It'd be nice to see that turn on. The unit is programmed, and they securely fasten it to the dog's neck. Let's just see how tight this one is. With the collar on, Dr. Mignecco prepares the reversal agent. I know, it'll take, a, it'll take several minutes for this to work. I got everything off because I know when he wakes up, he's going to be, uh, he's, this, this little guy has some energy. This little girl has some energy, so uh, when she wakes up, Right, and so I'm just getting her prepared to, to wake up on her own. Backing away, the team maintains a safe distance. As a disoriented animal can be extremely dangerous and may try to attack again. Eventually, the dog runs off to rejoin its pack. The team follows at a safe distance, monitoring the dogs. We'll just walk up to them, and there they go. Monster Quest is searching for predatory packs of wild dogs that are roaming America's Midwest. These dangerous packs have been known to attack and often carry fatal diseases. In 1981, Stephen King's horror story Cujo was released and inspired a hit movie. The story tells of a St. Bernard that was infected with rabies. The dog quickly turned into a monstrous killer. Like in Cujo, the danger of rabies in feral packs is very real and can be lethal. There's a saying that we learn in vet school. It's kind of a joke, but we do take it seriously. It's, called, it's, it's uh, think rabies first. And the reason for that is you may not get a second chance to think about it. The disease is not common in pets, but feral dogs can pass rabies on to humans. Dogs actually are a sentinel in, in the fact that they are like a buffer zone between the wild animals who can get rabies and us humans. Disease is not the only danger to humans. The animal's aggressive nature can prove deadly. 91-year-old Edward Gerlach was on his porch when a pack of American bulldogs living across the street attacked. It was horrific. It was horrific what happened. It appears that uh, Mr. Uh, Gerlach uh, had been here when these dogs attacked and mauled and killed him right, right in his front yard. Sherry Harper just happened to be by the Gerlach house when the dogs turned on her and claimed the life of a second victim. Eugene Gerlach arrived at his father's house and came upon the grisly scene. His father mauled to death. I could see my dad's body laying on the ground. We responded to a 911 call from a Mr. Gerlach. He had found his father in the front yard of his father's residence. Ten dogs were captured and were responsible for these grisly deaths. With the help of animal control, we took samples from, from the dogs, and it was uh, proven to be the blood from our two victims, Mr. Gerlach and Ms. Harper. It was horrific what happened. Uh, these two people were out here in the country enjoying uh, 
a nice fall day and they were encountered by a, a pack of, of dogs and, uh, and were mauled and killed. Biologist Peggy Callahan says there's a reason for a dog going from family pet to vicious killer. If you're trying to analyze why a dog attacks a human being, you first have to back up and look at wolves. Is there a predatory component to this? And I would say yes. That any time a predator attacks with intent to kill, uh, uh, some component of that is predatory. But dogs and wolves can be convinced that human beings are part of their pack. And so is it perhaps also a component that they are attacking and killing an intruder. Breeding can also be part of the problem. Unfortunately, we have to add in that we've created aberrations in dogs, we, behaviors, physical problems, there's seizure rages. These things can show up as a genetic problem in any breed that gets popular and gets bred poorly, which is what we do. We don't, we don't do it well. In an attempt to record the behavior of these aggressive dogs, Monster Quest is in Detroit, where wild dog packs strike fear into parts of the city. We couldn't drive through the streets of Pontiac without seeing large packs of dogs all over the place. Pam Porteous and Matt Shecker have been rescuing wild dogs for 15 years, but they've never seen anything like this. So we took it upon ourselves to start rounding them up. Um, we trapped probably 30 different packs. The problem seems to be getting worse. With the economy now, we're seeing a lot of abandonments, um, people losing their houses and leaving their animals behind or turning their animals loose to run the streets. Shecker and Porteous suggest that some abandoned industrial areas are the ideal locations to find the dogs. Um, the reason the dogs tend to, to migrate to this area is there is a straight shot from, from here down to the eastern market where there's an abundant supply of food, as well as a lot of vacant property, vacant buildings, vacant houses that the dogs can use as shelter. The team will use hidden cameras to observe the animals. Inside this barrel is a waterproof box and inside the waterproof box is a digital single lens reflex camera. Now that's a still camera, but the reason we chose it is because this is a new kind of digital single lens reflex camera that can also shoot high definition video. The barrel cam is positioned near a path used by the dogs. For a wider perspective on the area, photographer Jim Tittle is mounting another camera on the roof of an abandoned factory. The cameras are set to record at the times when feral packs are most active, dawn and dusk. Meanwhile, the East St. Louis expedition is attempting to locate their animal, which had been outfitted with a collar cap. Josh Millspaw is carefully monitoring the dog's movement. We're going to go ahead and we'll dial in the frequency then of that transmitter. We'll use this receiver to pick up the signal and we'll go ahead and we'll use this antenna to get direction. The collar is equipped with a release mechanism so the team can retrieve it without recapturing the dog. I, I think we're ready to get closer because we've got about two or three minutes before it's going to blow. Yeah. Let, let's go ahead and walk that direction. I don't think we'll disturb them from, that, from coming no. any closer. I The team cannot locate the dog or the car. It should have been released by now, but the signal's faded. That means it's likely still on the dog. They quickly devise another plan. Their tactic is to set up another baited trap to try to recapture the dog. What I'm going to do is go around and then flush the dog's back. So, and so I just want to know the the best direction to go. Yeah. The best, if you listen. Okay, I hear it. So now, it's coming right there. The pack has learned its lesson and is staying clear of the humans by taking refuge in a nearby wooded area. That they can maneuver in such dense, dense woods. 
course, that's a safety mechanism. Wow. You know, there's a lot of background noise. Do you think it's moving, Jeff? Not right now. The team moves deeper into the brush when Randy Grimm sees one of the dogs. She poked her head out and went back in. I didn't see a collar. It, it looked like the dog we trapped, but they all look pretty similar, so I'm not 100%. She poked her head out right, they're all right around here. The signal from the collar camera is fading. If the collar was here, and it is definitely not down here, we'd be getting a really good signal. Oh. The camera is a critical piece of evidence that may explain the dog's patterns if it can be recovered. Too bad we're not getting the, it's still filming? No. Filming. Oh, okay, I was like, wow, if it was still filming, I'd be curious where they're going now. Yeah, so it stopped yeah. filming, so at 11 it stopped. Okay. But yeah, I think that we need to uh, be careful that we're pushing them too far away. The team will head back to the trap area that's home to them, so they're going to come home. And they find that the trap set hours ago has something in it. This is a first for us. MonsterQuest is tracking packs of feral dogs to determine if they are responsible for vicious attacks across the country. While dog attacks aren't always reported, the Center for Disease Control estimates there's one every 40 seconds. And in some cases, they can be deadly. My investigator received a call about the death of a child whose body was found in the park. Ten-year-old Rodney McAllister was headed to a park in St. Louis. It was late afternoon on a cool spring day. The park was deserted, except for some dogs. The aggressive pack was running loose and attacked the boy. The child was lying on the ground. Part of the child's clothing was intact, part was torn off. The child was um, obviously dead and with numerous injuries. McAllister had been mauled to death. There were no eyewitnesses but the coroner was certain of the perpetrator. I mean, the child had scratches, the child had tears of the skin, the child had what were very clearly um, bite marks that were consistent with an animal and you know, most likely a dog. It was clearly uh, animal activity on, um, that the child had been preyed upon by animals. Mm -hmm. The expedition team is in East St. Louis, monitoring dog pack activity. After outfitting the dog with a camera on a collar, they are now trying to recapture the animal. A transmitter attached to the collar allows them to monitor the dog's location. The team spots the dog. The collar around its neck confirms the release mechanism has failed. Unfortunately, another dog has been caught in their trap. They must now reset it. This is a first for us. We've never done four traps out in a row. We set up four traps. I figure the odds are better. I figure that even if they go into the trap, they can wait in the trap, that less dogs in the group, and hopefully we'll get our girl. They bait the traps, and one dog ventures all the way in before escaping. The collared animal gets close, but won't go in. The odds of re-catching her right away I don't think are very good at all. She's starting to get trap savvy. She knows what the trap is now. Several dogs are trapped and released. We've caught everyone but her, so we're still empty-handed. I do think she's becoming trap savvy. They refresh the bait and set the doors. Then, finally. Hey, right. Get the truck and pull it up, and we'll just load her up like this. OK, great. OK, guys. Relax. Okay, I think the first thing we'll do is get this collar off. 
the ferrule's been brought to Dr. Ed McNecco for an exam and DNA testing. All right, there we go. All right, there's the collar. The DNA results could provide clues to the genetic background of the dog. Got it. Can you see that? Yeah, and the fecal sample we got showed tapeworms, which would be indicative of the fleas. You know, that's how, that's how tapeworms are transmitted. I mean, she seems in pretty, pretty good shape considering that she was born out in the wild. Could have possibly even done this without the muzzle, but again, I'm always very conscious of safety. Um, you know, if she would try to bite again, it would be out of fear. I'm not seeing any, no outward signs of aggression at all in her. The team has been able to retrieve the footage from the collar cam. They're surprised by what they see. Oh my oh, what, God. Oh, wow. What was that? Wow. Oh my gosh, oh my something God. is trying to bite the camera. In cities throughout the country, people are being attacked in parks, on the street, even in their own backyards by vicious dogs. Monster Quest is investigating this new phenomenon. This woman was attacked while working. This man is tracking feral packs to see if they may be responsible. This doctor's DNA analysis may shed light on the genetic character and temperament of these dogs. The expedition team gathers to view the footage from the video collar experiment. What was this, Joel? Six frames per second? Six frames per second. It is a little choppy. The camera was rolling when the dog was roaming the streets. It reveals the view from the dog's perspective. Is that her running? That yes. Must be. That's the sound of her running. Just run with this now and see where it goes. But, you know, that's really cool. That they've, she's been, they've been in a pack this whole time. You think they always stay in the pack? Oh, yeah. It's that security. Right. That, that's what keeps them safe in their life. Their territory includes these abandoned homes. Oh my yeah. gosh! Oh, this oh my is gosh, awesome! Cool. Went in. Okay, oh this man! Is cool. This. Oh wow! Deep. But I don't know where this house is. Oh look at that! Look at her! Look at that other one! Jump out the window! There she goes! Wow! That's cool. Oh man! You got to find that house. Awesome. They didn't stay in very long. The pack never encounters humans, but the dogs clearly notice the camera. Oh, my oh, God. Look at that. Oh, oh. What was that? Wow. Oh, my oh, gosh. Something trying is bite. trying to bite the camera. More than once, the other pack members go after the camera. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Ooh. Wow. The footage is only a snapshot of where the dogs go and what they do. I think one of the most fascinating things to me was that the pack of dogs prefer or seem more comfortable in the woods than they do, say, on the streets. We may have, might just be hitting the tip of the iceberg on packs of dogs because you would never think to go look deep in the woods for them. I guess I'm not surprised to see them use these wild areas, the open areas. Biologist Peggy Callahan offers some insight on the footage. Food acquisition is probably why they go in toward human areas, not, not necessarily any other reason. They've got to find food, they've got to work around people. You know, there's probably some kind of fun accidental food sources found here. They may kill things on occasion, but, but this is definitely where they would go to for um, least conflict. There you can see she's scratching at that collar. You can just, what is it? It's weird. Oh, <laughs> somebody's checking out that camera big time. They're very curious. This is, a, this is the pack member. She's been gone. She's come back. She smells different. She's been touched. They know the smell of every single person that touched that dog. They know the smell of the muzzle. They know the smell of the antiseptic, everything. And then there's new, this new device on her. So she and they get out to a safe place, and then they stop and go, OK, now what do you have here? What is it? And of course, what does a dog use to investigate? They use their mouths. So these, these little guys have, have uh, pointy ears, and pointy ears seems to go away fairly quickly in the gene pool. 
um, when you start you start mixing in the labs and the retrieving breeds. So these guys must have husky male shepherd in there. Geneticist Neil Fretwell may be able to verify Callahan's assessment. He has completed his DNA analysis of the blood samples taken from the dogs captured in East St. Louis. Ancestry is determined by comparing the dog's genetic markers against an extensive database of purebreds. There was no recent ancestry from purebred dogs detected in feral mother. However, what we did find was traces of ancestry. The first one was the German Shepherd. The second one was the Bull Terrier. Bull Terriers were originally bred for use in bull fights. German Shepherds are often used as guard dogs. With both breeds, there are reported incidents of aggression towards animals and people. In the juvenile feral dog we tested, we actually found some different breeds and a different influence in, in the dog. There was much more influence from the ancient cluster of dog breeds. So one of the breeds we detected was the Alaskan Malamute. And this was actually the strongest influence in juvenile ferals um, background. But we also found traces of, of the Chow Chow, which again is an ancient dog breed. The juvenile also had traces of German Shepherd. The German Shepherd dog and the Chow Chow are two breeds that are actually very tenacious, uh, well known for their guarding qualities, and therefore they would give um, juvenile feral some very um, good characteristics for life in the wild. The two ferals share physical characteristics, including black short hair coats, a medium build, and upright prick ears. What would tend to happen is the dominant genes um, that are giving the dogs traits would um, really predominate within the population. In Detroit, Jim Tittle is reviewing footage that his cameras captured. In its first location, the barrel camera caught footage of a stray foraging for food. There's wildlife all over. Uh, and if you talk to the street people, you find out the dogs are here. Just they're very, very wary. It's because they don't want to get caught. The roof camera had a broad overview of an old rail line traveled by feral dogs and humans. The activity increases at dusk. The camera captures images of three dogs, proving the area is a habitat for feral packs. The people that live here pretty much coexist with the dogs. They're not really pets, but occasionally some of them feed the dogs just like we feed the birds. This Monster Quest investigation has uncovered some interesting information. It has shown rising populations of uncontrolled feral dog packs in major American cities. These packs know how to stay undercover and continue breeding by hiding in abandoned buildings and wooded areas. And DNA tests reveal that some of the aggressive breeds used in dog fighting have mixed with the feral dog population. Those are dogs that are surviving by avoiding us. They're staying out of trouble. They're staying away from us. They're using us for food sources. They are doing a, a very wolfy behavior, and that is reverting to uh, avoidance behavior. And that's, that's what's keeping them alive. It's an epidemic. But it's an epidemic that's so hard to contain that even animal welfare isn't paying attention to it. The feral dog is just a scavenger. The odd man out dog can be the killer.